You know that what Academic Partnerships is trying to do is help yes. public universities take advantage and thrive in the future, take advantage of the technology and the new expectation of 21st century consumers. Yes. And it seems the world is in a process of, of higher education, of transitioning from a producer-driven or provider-driven model to a consumer-driven model. Mm -hmm. And I'm interested in how you see your theory of disruptive innovation or concept, I guess it's beyond the theory, but concept yeah. of disruptive innovation impacting higher education. This technology is a quintessential disruptive innovation because disruptive innovations transform things that are so affordable, are so expensive and complex that only the rich and people with skill can own and use these products or services. And disruptive innovation transforms those things into things that are so affordable and accessible that many more people have access to them and can use them. And so the Model T was one of these. Before that, only a few could own a car. Now everybody can own a car. You know. um, before the in computing, when it was mainframe computers, only the really rich could have one. And then the personal computer and then the, the uh, smartphone makes it available to everybody. Mm -hmm. And the very same thing is happening in higher education. For a long time, you had to be rich in order to have access to it. And then you had to be able to go in debt to have access to it. And now mm -hmm. it's affordable and so you can have great education without going into debt. Exactly. With a thousand universities going online around the world, public and private, uh, in this country and other countries, selling essentially the same programs, That's right. competition is going to become extraordinary. And I just wonder what your thoughts are about the future viability of so many schools when higher education is the most abundant of all consumer categories. Yes. Boy, you're focusing on a really big issue. So my sense is that historically there has never been any competition on price, except maybe in the last 10 years giving people more scholarships effectively is in, in, uh, introducing price to the equation. But the reason why there has been no uh, base, uh, price based competition is the government itself essentially has put a floor on, on uh, tuition. And in other words, um, just take Harvard where I am, there is a cost and therefore we need to pr uh, set um, tuition in a way that roughly covers the cost. That's a very high uh, floor, but thank goodness the government provides Pell Grants and uh, uh, s student loans, sometimes uh, subsidized, and that puts a floor. And it's kind of like a hydraulic jack, and you put it <coughs> under the, po the, to the co costs, the cost of the in institution. And because you can recover investments in higher tuition, and the government just moves that hydraulic jack underneath it, you know. And so the way the universities compete is, I'll, I'll make a better foot, football stadium. And their competitors then have to hire, build an even better football stadium. And these guys will make beautiful dorms. And so these guys have to compete. We create this pro program, the competitors add that, you know. And so it's just offering more and more. And much of this is very good, but it's costly. And the government just will, get, will allow individual doc, um, students to have two Pell Grants, not just one. And you can go even deeper in debt to cover all of this cost. And so now, these hydraulic jacks are about as far as they will go, just as far as they will go. And the universities don't know how to cut costs. 
they've never had to do it before, you know. And now, as you say, thousands, a thousand universities are coming in with the same content. And now we will see price competition in a way that you have never seen it before. Because now the government can't uh, put this, the, the floor up anymore. And I think it's going to be really quite scary. I bet you that 10 years from now, maybe half of all of the universities will be in bankruptcy. And uh, people who sit back and, and deny that this is going to happen really have their feet, their, their head in the sand. One thing we've seen more and more over the last few years is the realization that higher education is not an event. It's, it's something that goes on for a lifetime. Oh my gosh. Particularly for a working adult who, need, who needs to return to college over and over again if mm -hmm. they're going to advance in their careers yes. or qualify for new 21st century jobs. Yes. And they can only do this with the use of technology. They mm -hmm. have family obligations, work obligations. They co can't go back to our great universities and go back into the dorms and yeah. become campus uh, students. Yes. And given that reality, and that the percentage of all college goers are more and more a higher, higher percentage being working adults, why do you think universities have been so resistant to serve this student and utilize the technology to make that education available yeah. to this very productive citizen? Yeah. You know, I think, I think Randy, that What's going on is that the constraints that s shaped the delivery of higher education, the constraints have flipped. So by analogy in uh, healthcare, uh, a century ago, um, doctors were cheap and transportation was expensive. Mm -hmm. And so that meant that you had to build a, a hospital in every community, and every hospital needed to offer a, a solution to everybody. And that's where they came the notion, we got the notion of a community hospital and a general hospital, because transportation was expensive and doctors were cheap. Now that's flipped, <laughs> and transportation is cheap and doctors are expensive, and yet the trustees of every community hospital still try to invest to become the next Johns, Hap Johns Hopkins, you know. And, and they don't realize what used to be a constraint is now an opportunity, you know. And you see the same thing in higher education. The fixed cost of creating uh, physical buildings and to prepare to, to teach the class and when you're doing it, everybody needs to be together because the professors was a f fixed cost, you know? And so they, it, it exists because of constraints. And now those constraints are flipped. You, know, you don't need, you don't need a, a physical teacher standing in front of you because you can take it down whenever you're ready. It's exactly like you said, you know? And there's no physical facilities that you have to leverage. And so it's, it's flipped, but most universities still behave as if the, the, um, the binding constraints are the same, and they've flipped. Another trend we're seeing is that across the developed world, enrollment is stagnating or declining. I know this past year in continental Europe, British Isles, the freshman classes were down six, six and a half percent. The United States had declined in Roma for the first time in 15 years. Mm -hmm. Yet in the developing world, demand is growing, economies are growing, GDP growth is much greater than ours, yeah. and huge increases in enrollment. Yeah. Do you think that some of our wonderful brands will catch on to that opportunity and become iconic institutions that serve hundreds of thousands of students around the world and leverage their great brands and become a new breed of global 
mm -hmm. uh, multinational educational institution. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely, Randy. It, it, when disruption occurs, where the brands are created flips. And so in the history of computing, uh, the first generation were mainframe computers and the components inside were kind of commoditized. And what really created, or what created value in the, the mainframe computer was the artistry by which IBM knitted those pieces together. And then the next generation, the mini computers made by companies like Digital Equipment, again, the components inside weren't, no one component made a significant difference in the performance of the system. It was at the system level that the brand was created. Mm -hmm. But then in the personal computer, which was the big disruptor, then where the brand is created flips because the standards for how to, the components fit together were so clear that anybody could get the same components and mm. and uh, and so the the value of the brand went to inside so the Intel inside and the Microsoft inside and now the Nvidia inside um, is where where the performance is created anybody can assemble these things <laughs> it's the components inside and that's that's the opportunity for the best universities is to become the Harvard inside of a thousand universities around the mm. world, you know. And oh my gosh, mm -hmm. we, we espouse that we want to have an impact on the world to change the way leaders think. And if that's really what we espouse for ourselves, you know, and then we allow only a couple thousand people from the world every year to come here. <laughs> I, we, this is our aspiration. This is what we do. And now the technology allows us to truly do what our founders uh, thought about. You know, three hundred years. It's almost a moral ago. dilemma, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> if you've got something that it can have such an impact on the world. That's right. And the capability of sharing it. That's right. Certainly something should be considered. It's an opportunity long before it's a threat.